uh, to to help the whole organisation um, do better processes of, of sort of end of life. And then there's initiatives like Design and Dignity, which look at the creation of uh, uh, specific initiatives within hospital buildings. And then on the other hand, in the bereavement side of the house, I suppose, there are projects which look specifically at uh, suicide or uh, young people, childhood bereavement, uh, childhood death, infant death, and things like the bereavement hotline, uh, which uh, we launched really at the beginning of COVID. So there are places for people to go to for whatever kind of support they need. So it's a very broad, um, very broad church, very broad kind of organisation. And it's focus is really that, that every death matters, regardless of how people die or where they die. Those uh, are valuable. If every person counts, then every death counts. So let me share some slides to give me a kind of guide. Uh, and I can talk you through these. Uh, and they're a, they're a guide for me rather than a, um, let me just move everything so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, rather than me just talking through the slides. I'm also going to hide myself because I find talking to myself on the computer is a way to some kind of strangeness. So Hospice Foundation is about dying and grieving well wherever. And the, the vision of the Hospice Foundation is about an Ireland where people experiencing dying, death and bereavement are provided with the care and support they need. So if you die at home, if you die suddenly, if you die in a hospital, how do we as an organization help people find what they need? Um, and we're working towards the best end of life care and the best bereavement care for everybody. So it's a really uh, wide population uh, with lots of different um, needs and, and lots of different ways that we connect with people. And we're the only national charity that do this through advocacy, education and services. So um, we run training programs, we run programs like Death in the Workplace, we run the Breathing Hotline, we do work on policy, we do face-to-face -face work, big range of uh, work. And when people say, well, well why? I, I tend to think about this. Um, so this is, I don't know whether any of you remember Snoopy and Charlie Brown. Um, so Snoopy's the little dog and Charlie Brown is the little boy who has a, a great philosophy on, on life. And in one of the cartoons, uh, Charlie Brown is saying, you know, someday we'll all die, Snoopy. And his pet dog is saying, true, but on all the other days, we'll not. And that's very much part of the driver, the motivation for why we're doing this kind of work. Um, if we can plan uh, individually or organizationally, for end of life, for bereavement, then when we get there, maybe we make it slightly less challenging than it might be. Um, and we know that death affects everybody, obviously. Uh, on an average day in Ireland, about 80 people die. And we recognise that for every death, there are at least 10 people impacted. So for every 80 deaths, there are 800 people who are newly bereaved. And obviously it's, you know, it's a broad number, it's an average number. But it means that over the next uh, couple of years, pre-COVID, um, about 160,000 people will die and 1.6 million people will be grieving. So grief is everywhere, death is everywhere. It's everybody's business, really. And everybody has um, ambitions about what they'd like to do before they die or the conversations they'd like to have um, and we always think we'll have enough time and uh, sometimes we don't. And so I love this George Bernard Shaw quote, which he says, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that communication has taken place. So quite often we think that we're able to have conversations about death, dying, grief and loss. Uh, we think we're able to have conversations that might be complicated or challenging. We think they've taken place um, and that's not necessarily true. Maybe quite often people don't really understand what it is we think we said. 
So a lot of our work is really trying to make those conversations possible. In 2016, uh, we carried out, a, the, the Hospice Foundation carried out a national kind of audit. It's called the People's Charter on Dying, Death and Bereavement. And uh, if you're interested, I can send you copies. So the IHF went out and talked to about, in the end, about 3,000 people to find out what it was that they wanted. And they said things like, I want to live and die in an island where death is talked about and not hidden away, where I can plan ahead, where I can get information about what's happening to me, where I'm supported to stay in control of my own decisions. And for the people that matter to me, I want Ireland to be a country where people understand grief and don't avoid thinking or talking about it, where family and friends are supported during a loved one's illness and after their death, where people get time to grieve, to talk and to remember. And this People's Charter led us to really think quite hard about one question, which is, are we talking enough and you'd think that you think that we are I mean, we're a country well known for chatting but I'll just stop that that's not me um, but when we really looked into it the answer is that we're not always talking as much as we think we are um, sorry, let me just, I'm moving around slides. Bear with me a second. And it's, if you, if you spend a bit of time thinking about it, you think that actually it's not the obvious people that are not doing the conversation. So sometimes in the medical world, people are taught to um, maintain health. They're taught to treat on this, but to maintain health. That's their, 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 their oath, really. Um, and quite often doctors, it's not necessarily a big part of their education um, to talk about death and dying. And so quite often they'll opt for continuing treatment because the perception of death in a medicalized framework is that death is a failure. Whereas actually, as we all know, it's, it's normal, but there's a tendency, particularly from a medical framework to think that, you know, there must be something else that we can try. There must be, uh, an opportunity to save lives at all cost. And that's become a gradually a kind of societal expectation. And then on a family's perspective, people find it difficult to talk about dying um, because there's this sense that if it's, if it's a failure, if we're thinking about it as an illness or as part of an illness, then actually we're not doing all that we can. Maybe there's something more we can do. As the um, academic Harvey Carell says, death is a central problem for everybody, especially for ill people who face concrete and imminent concerns. It's everybody's problem, it's everybody's challenge. And where we die might not be where we think. So 40% of people in Ireland tend to die in hospitals, 23% at home, uh, about 23% in nursing homes and hospitals. So if where we die is spread out, then, then how we're supported in those places really matter. And that becomes a big part of the work of the Hospice Foundation, because what we know from the research is that Irish people want what you probably all want. People want to be surrounded by their loved ones. They want to be free from pain. Those are the, the top two biggest um, desires, I suppose. People want privacy and dignity. They want to be in familiar surroundings. So if that's what people want, the Hospice Foundation's work becomes about how do we do that? And then um, if we think, I'm gonna skip that slide. If we think about the uh, way that we think about end of life and death and dying, what we tend to do is think about the pink bits. We think about prolonging life and palliative care. We might think, that before that about screening for health conditions, we might think a little bit about the gray box, risk reducing. And the green bit, which is, is death education and literacy, we tend not to think about or talk about perhaps as much as we, we should. So an easy way I think of thinking about this is 
we tend to think about death, dying, grief, and loss at the downriver perspective. So if life is a river, we tend to think about the end bit of it. We tend not to think about what we might be able to do upstream. So if we spend a bit of time upstream thinking about death education and literacy, thinking about dying, death, grief, and loss, thinking about how we can prepare, then actually when we get downstream to where we're impacted, to where somebody dies who's significant to us or where we're facing our own end of life, then perhaps we can have better tools to make that stage of everybody's life uh, easier. And there are obviously, there are lots of things that stop us from having those conversations with each other. So I might just stop the share there. And I'm really interested in, in knowing from you, what are the things that you think stop us from having conversations? What gets in the way? Uh, you might open your mics or if you can type into the chat box. Why are those so, such difficult conversations? They're really, Annie. Yeah, um, really fascinated just listening to you at the beginning there and I've made little notes to myself. Uh, love to see a, a copy of the People's Charter, but um, the one thing that comes to mind is I have a daughter and she's the only child um, and her dad's still alive and I'm still alive, obviously. <laughs> um, but she, I know she really does worry about the day that we're not around anymore and I'd love mm -hmm. to help prepare her I'd love her yeah. to see this, This um, to be listening to you right now, to be sitting next to me, although she's working, one of the few that can at the moment. Um, yeah. And I'd love her to see this, but I don't really know how to approach that, um, you know, without her feeling, oh my God, I don't want to talk about this. It's, you know, she wants to think of me living forever. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else, what else is, why are your conversations about death, dying, grief, and loss so complicated? I think we have to have a, a conversation with ourselves first to realize yeah. that we are going to die. But it's very hard to talk about it to people, I've discovered, because I, I'm inclined to feel people are not very responsive. I, I'm trying to get my enduring power of attorney and my wills done and things. But it's very hard. to. I'm sort of wanting to talk to friends about it, but they're not very keen to talk about it. Yeah. While I'm very a bit preoccupied by it at the moment, just to... Uh, feel I've got them underway and doing them and talking about it. But it's whether the resistance is in me or in them, I'm not 100% sure. Is it that it's like a taboo? But it's a like a taboo or you're, you're, you're changing the atmosphere if you yeah. start talking about things like that. You're not being cheery, cheery, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, everything's lovely. <laughs> it would be nice to be able to talk about death in a cheery way. You know, it's well, just another, it's, it's the end of, of something, anyway. and who knows, maybe the start of something else. I don't know, you know. Well, I had just, a, yeah. a wonderful experience with my my own mother's passing. We we knew she, she had a terminal illness, and I took a leave of absence and went and lived with her and worked with her, and we spent a lot of time talking, and my sisters, I have two older sisters, and they didn't want to talk about it at all. And she wanted to, so I was very open to it. And we actually laughed a lot. Yeah. And, yes. we, you know, I she told me what she wanted, things, you know, for the funeral and that. And we started making really silly suggestions and we were just kind of going completely over the top. And, you know, we, we, were, we were giggling and she said, oh, gosh, I wish I could be there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and mm -hmm. it was quite funny. One of the things I, I spoke at my mum's funeral and said, um, my mum was quite often late, as I, I can sometimes be as well. And I said, well, at least at least Doreen was on time today, you know, and everybody laughed because they knew her, you know. So even during that, you can it's it's really good to get your um, to get your feelings and your, um, your 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 wishes out there and. As you, you know, like you can't force somebody to talk about it, but if they see that you're comfortable with the subject, yeah. they're more likely to be. There was there was somebody mm. here, Joan, just came on and said that um, she just keeps putting it off. Joan, I can see you've got your. Joan, I can see you've got your mic on. Explain. Uh, uh, yeah, um, 
I mentioned cremation uh, to the family, and uh, I was amazed, really. There was great resistance to it, especially with my eldest daughter. She said, oh, and what, what about the grave and the memorial stone and the family grave? And um, she is married, but they don't have any children. And she said, actually, um, we had thought about uh, being buried with ye in a family grave. Hmm. So uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting this. Hmm. So yeah. I just put it in the back of my mind uh, after that. So how do, how do, did anybody else come up against that? Or, or, Mary know, McQueen. Well, I think the whole thing about death is, is almost something you can't talk about. I remember a lighthearted moment. I would call it lighthearted moment. The grandson was in the house with his parents and he was as wild as a monkey and he was wrecking the place and you know, it was early morning and I suggested, I suggested lightly, just to get him under control, that I bring him down to Dean's Grange graveyard for a walk. And he's very companionable, like I get him to read the grave, the headstones to, to his granny because his granny's eyesight is so poor. And he's very nice like that. But the parents were horrified. Oh, mother, you'd bring him to, you'd bring him to a graveyard. Oh, that's that, that's very dark, Mother. I suppose oh. that is wrong with taking them to a graveyard for a walk. <laughs> so, I lived I lived near one when I was growing up, and I used to stroll and wonder about the lives of the people. And it wasn't a bit dark. Never got any nightmares about it. The only nightmare, the only pe things people who gave me nightmares were living people. <laughs> very true. I remember my mother telling a story when she was young that she used to meet, um, she lived in Clonus and she was Catholic and she had a Protestant boyfriend and they used to meet in the graveyard and have a wee kiss behind one of the gravestones. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's two things happening. You might mute your mics for a second and I'll, I'll, I'll open them up again in a minute. But there are two things happening. The first one is it's very difficult to find a space to go and have a chat like we're doing now. Because as soon as you make that possible, people's experience is huge and diverse and all these conversations are happening. It's just that we don't talk to each other about it. And so once you can make a space for the conversation to happen, the conversation flows and we end up laughing about it. The second thing is what I think of as the the, 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 the ghost under the bed or, you know, the bogeyman, the thing that lives under the bed. And the thing that, you know, when you're a child and there's always something lives in the cupboard or under the bed or it's hiding behind the curtains. And actually the only way of finding out about that and dispelling the fear is to go and look under the bed or open the cover or take the curtains back. It's to look at the thing. And so because we don't look at the thing, it gets bigger in our heads. It becomes more scary. So this whole... Uh, the opposite of a virtual circle, a negative circle happens where we don't look at the thing, it's in our heads, we don't talk about it, we get more afraid of it, and off we go. And uh, I'm going to come back to the slides for a bit and uh, go through there. So that, the sort of things you're talking about are really what we found um, from conversation with each other. We're afraid of upsetting each other. You know, it's, it's, it's maybe not good manners. We're not confident. Like, because we don't talk about it, we kind of don't know how, and we feel a bit clumsy, and we feel a bit awkward. Understandably, we want to protect ourselves and those we care about, but are we doing more harm than good in not having the conversation? I love the idea that, you know, the way that you have the conversation is you wander around a graveyard, a graveyard with, the, with the young fella, because then you can have the conversation. You've made a space for that conversation to happen. And all of this together, obviously, it, it makes us, feel uncomfortable we don't quite know what to say or do and yet the most common problems people encounter following death are regret you know and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know I didn't get the chance to ask I, I didn't know what she would have wanted I wish I knew and so you know the the only thing what's the the great thing uh, sorry the, the most common thing that people say at end of life is I wish I'd done that thing and what we found from, from researching, from talking to people who are, are bereaving, is it's still all about regret. So actually making the opportunity to have a conversation is a step to take that away. So we can't stop people from dying. 
obviously. Therefore, how do we prepare for it better? How do we live with it better? And that's really a big part of the Irish Hospice Foundation's work and a big part of uh, Bex's work, particularly with Think Ahead. So I know she'll be scheduled to come back and talk about this particular. And it's a really useful uh, booklet and a tool for helping you guide through those conversations. Um, and so I'm not going to get in detail about it, but I want to touch on it because I think it's related to the conversation we've been having. So an, an AHD is an advanced healthcare directive. Uh, it's some of you might be familiar with them there. Do I want to have this, that or, or the procedure? Um, thinking ahead is about more than that. It's really about all of these things. It's about where are your passwords for your papers? Um, do you want to happen to you after you do Jones conversation, you know, about cremation? It's those kind of conversations. What are your wishes and values? Um, it's a chance to have a conversation with your family, with your partners, with your lovers, with your healthcare workers. For some people, it's a chance to have a conversation just in case you're not able to speak for yourself if you have a stroke or if. So it's to try and get rid of all that stress so that you can get on with the business of living. Um, and obviously there are lots of other little pieces that fit into that. So that's um, the, the, the kind of general thrust of the work. But by talking to each other, we can make preparation and planning easier, easier and even beautiful, whether it's an unexpected death or a slow waltz to the finish line. Thank you, Michael, for that quote. I love that, a slow waltz to a finish line, um, which kind of brings me to the arts and creative engagement work. So uh, the Hospice Foundation has always sort of dipped its toe since it started in the 80s in, in arts and creativity, in its role and function um, and place in the work that it does. And recently, with a little bit of support from a, an organisation called Creative Ireland, it's began to get a bit more thoughtful and considered about this. So the next 20 minutes, maybe, maybe a bit less, I'll talk about this. So. Um, to do this, what it decided was an arts policy, which I, I don't know about you, but policy doesn't really float my boat, but really for the Hospice Foundation, it was saying, well, what's, what does the arts do? What doesn't it do? What do we want to do? And it said, well, we think that the arts, cultural and creative work can, can help broaden and deepen conversations in Ireland about dying, death, grief and loss. And what do we mean by the arts and culture? Well, we, really broad. So it could be painting, it could be theatre, it could be the Abbey, it could be the local amateur dramatic society, but it could be gardening and walking, it could be knitting, it could be... And underpinning this is, is what we learned from the People's Charter. People want to have conversations, they want more conversations. So how can the arts and, and creative work and craft work, how can it help with that? And how does it align with it with a kind of human rights approach? So this isn't particularly about uh, arts for health. It's not about arts and therapy. Um, yeah, art therapy. It's more about human rights, the right for freedom of expression, the right for your voice to be heard, the way that that might happen. So we know that. And the policy recommended a couple of ways that we might work. That we, We're not an arts organisation, so who can we collaborate with? Can we make a partnership with uh, uh, Stephen and Bitchin? Can we make a partnership with um, Crafts Council? Can we find ways of working with other organisations to uh, make the opportunity to explore your own voice um, wherever you might be and uh, yeah, wherever you might be? So my job is really about making that happen. Um, and in the last uh, month, we just uh, announced some seed grants, that, sadly for everybody here, ended on Friday. We have 72 applications from all across the country of people looking for ways to make those conversations possible. They range from uh, poster projects to uh, working with people with disability to uh, crafts projects to a whole range and some of which I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, we're working on poetry projects with Poetry Island, because quite often what happens is, is particularly in grief, the grief kind of has this 
habit of blowing away the words. You, you can't quite find the words that you need to make sense of what you're feeling and sensing. Um, and we've started these uh, sessions where we are working with arts organisations to raise their literacy, really, partly because of the pandemic. Um, so their literacy, their familiarity, their confidence in how to have conversations that all others find difficult. But we think as the pandemic eases, lots of people who have grief or, or loss that's, that's pandemic related uh, will be wandering into the art centres and the libraries and possibly into their local choir or their local crafts group. And those are great places where conversations can happen that help people through a process of reflection, remember, but sorry, the way around, remembrance and reflection. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what arts and creativity make possible. And we've sort of touched on this COVID pandemic piece. So one of the most extraordinary things about the last 12 months, maybe 12 months, um, is that everybody has some form of loss. So that loss might be, um, it, it might be something like, I can't go on holiday. It might be, I can't uh, travel outside of my, my, what are we on at the moment? Seven kilometers, I forget. Um, it might be much more significant. It might be uh, somebody's died. It might be somebody's died and they're far away or somebody's in the process of dying and we can't grieve in the way that we normally would. We can't go to funerals. I'm sure you've all experienced that, we all have. So what can we do to try and make conversations about loss, death and dying normal? Can we make many different points of connection? Um, because so many things are, are interrupted because our normal way of doing this is, is a challenge really. Can we make spaces like this online and what else can we do? And when we thought about the arts and, and crafts and creativity, there are four things that are really significant that they enable. So the first one is space and time. When, you, when you're making something, if you're sitting making something, you, you, you have to sort of stop, you have to slow down. If you, if you knit or if you paint or if you join a choir, or whatever you do, there's a dedicated amount of time and it creates this space and time when you can have conversations about other things. And quite often when you're uh, working away, when you're, when, you're, when you're making something, the brain goes off in a funny kind of place and you can have conversations about things that are not necessarily the, the thing that you're painting blue or the, the actual task that you're doing. The second one is, is what we call a significant third. So um, you listen to a piece of music and you talk to your friend about the piece of music. And in that conversation, you, you might be able to touch on things that if you had a direct conversation, you couldn't normally touch on. So I go to the theater and I see a show uh, with my friend, Billy, and Billy and I have a conversation about the show, but actually what I'm talking about is that I really miss uh, the friend of mine that died last year. And so it gives you a way in. There is significant third, and that applies to music and theater and painting and sculpture and pretty much anything. It's a way to bridge a conversation that might be difficult. The third way, we sort of touched on this with the poetry, is you're overloaded by, by sensation. You can't find the words. You've got this turmoil of emotion, whether it's because you're, you, you know, you're, you're at the end of life or you're bereaved or something significant has happened and you can't access the language. But maybe you can draw it, maybe you can paint it. And we apply that quite a lot to young children. We think about that as a way that young children communicate as they're trying to find the words. But actually there are many points during our lives when we don't have the language and death, dying, grief and bereavement is one of them. And it's directly connected with this idea that is fundamental of what the arts offer. The arts help us make meaning. Sometimes I read a book and somebody says something in a way that makes everything make sense. Behavior of people, um, <laughs> why somebody's so terrible to somebody else. Uh, something I'm feeling because I, I hit a certain age and stage. So the arts help us make meaning, whether we are looking at them, whether we're audience, whether we're involved in, in making them, uh, or whether they are made with us and for us. 
So I want to try and give you a few examples. And I'm gonna start off with this. Um, back in about 1974, uh, a GP writing in the British Medical Journal, who's the editor of the Medical Journal said, if health is about adaptation, I always get that word wrong. If health is about ad adaptation, I got it right. If health is about adaptation, understanding and acceptance. Then the arts might be more potent than anything that medicine has to offer. And uh, if you unpick that a little bit, what he was getting at was there are points in our life where we fundamentally change. So uh, my understanding of, I'm now 56. So my understanding of who I am now, part of my brain thinks I'm 16. And I can, uh, I tried to do a handstand about two months ago and it fell on my head because my arms won't do it. But I was convinced in my head, because I was slightly drunk. Um, I'm kind of convinced I can eat everything that I wanted to do and I can't do that anymore. So I've got to adapt. I've got to adapt my understanding of who I am. And so this meaning making function of the arts or finding a character in a book who is a bit like who I am now, finding something I can identify is really, incredibly important because it gives us stories that allow ourselves to try on different uniforms for who we might be now as we go through a life that's full of changes. Um, you can see the way that the arts are helpful to people happening an awful lot at the moment during the pandemic. So these little white pieces of paper are um, uh, Macrame, not macrame, the one where you fold it up. You know what I mean? Um, origami. Okay. And this started in, uh, so this is the roof of Ripon Cathedral. And some of the, the volunteers that, that work and help out in the cathedral started making these little paper things back in the early part of last year, around April and May. And every time they folded one up, they were thinking of someone who died. They were thinking of somebody who died of COVID or somebody that they knew of, and each one became a person. It was each fold kind of made this, this symbol of an individual, I suppose. And they, other people kind of joined in, and it became a bit like um, Huckleberry Finn painting the fence, you know? People going along saying, what are you doing? So I'm painting the fence. Would you like to help me as a paintbrush? And eventually there's like 10 people painting the fence and Huckleberry Finn sitting back watching them. It's the same kind of process. If people were invited to make a paper angel, and then they had so many, they thought, well, what do we do with these? And so they've hung them from the roof. And so when you walk into the cathedral, you look up and you can see this magnificent um, display that's made out of individual folds in paper, a tiny thing that you can do with any paper that you have lying around. It doesn't take lots of resources. It takes single effort. Um, this is from Tala Hospital. So, uh, they were challenged by this thing we're all challenged with that we can't grieve and we can't connect with people as we're normally used to doing. So they have a crocheting group in, in the hospital um, and the crocheting group said okay what we can do is we can make an object twice, we can make little hearts or little flowers or we can make two of everything and one of them is going to go to the person that's in hospital and one of them is going to go to the person who's at home so that I don't have two of the same thing, but you'll get the idea. You can, um, you can hold the thing at home or you can hold the thing if you're in hospital and just sort of holding the same thing. It's a lovely way of, it does something interesting to your head. So you're, you're, you're almost holding this, the person that you're thinking of. Some huge creativity in, in thinking, how do, we, how do we manage to connect when we're apart? How can craft groups or knitting groups or, how can, they, how can they bridge these, our, our need for connection? Um, and you can also see this type of thing popping up. So this is a church in Dublin, some up on the north side. Those little white stripes are little paper crucifixes, paper crosses, um, and each one is a person in that community. So it's, it's like the, the, the um, bunches of flowers that you see popping up on the side of the road. They're a way of marking and mem memorializing. And it's what art has always done. Um, this is a Paul Clay painting from the 1920s, late 20s, I think, called uh, Life and Death. And you can see death is always present. And then on the right hand side, uh, people are at different stages of life. So art 
in the 1920s that engage with life and death and and how do we find images or words for things that are so difficult to engage with um and sometimes we can find updated versions of this this is from 2000 and something where they made a, a, a version of the Paul Clay picture but with people but you can think back and see it throughout history really the idea of portraiture is that we fix someone in time the idea of a whether it's a photograph or whether it's a painting whether it's a marble bust we're trying to fix people in time we're trying to connect and memorialize them and um, this is um a woman called Celia Pym who works in craft her whole thing is is knitting and darning so what you can see are uh, little squares of of pieces of something that she's mended and fixed and so that might be your favorite jumper or your socks and she invites people to bring things to her that she mends and fixes and darns um and as people are doing that conversation start and the conversations are about well why do i choose this to keep this tiny jumper that i'm never going to fit in again or this wedding dress or these socks why do i keep these socks and it's because you've invested them with a value other than how much it costs to buy them it's because it's significant in some way to you um and she does all she does this in all sorts of different places one of the places was with trainee surgeons so these are young trainee surgeons um and she was sitting in a corner of the place where these people get taught and educated and she invited people to bring in you know you might see the tiny jumper with the little darning or the bag where the corner had gone and so it began a conversation about if you're a surgeon what's the point where you can't sew things back together where you can't fix things and we all know really some things aren't fixable some things you live with grief is something that you live with it doesn't really go away you grow a life back around it maybe so the process of making something becomes a way that uh that conversation which we were talking about at the beginning um is made easier and is made possible and there are lots of other contemporary versions of this this is a i love this it's um it's there is a an art group that i sometimes work with that are based in in south london and uh it's an art group of 90 year olds and they were incredibly frustrated with they said there's something happened around the time i retired where i became mysteriously invisible i walked down the street and people looked through me and I, I i really have to make an effort for people to talk to me and i don't know what happened other than i just got a bit older it's really annoying and so this is an, an art group of 90 year olds so they make things and so they said uh, eventually this idea came up which was we, we want to make a, something where we we where we appear in our beds in the public street and so they did so uh this is um elaine she's 90 no she's 89 in that photograph she's now about 92 uh and around her is a group of people making sure she's safe and she's technically abandoned and the first time that we did this we did this in a place where there's a market it's a um, mixed place a bunch of young teenagers came by and they saw Elaine in a bed and they didn't, they didn't go and talk to her but what they did was they went to the nearest place with a desk which looked like a kind of you know place where you report a crime and they walked him to what happened to be the library and they said we want to report a crime somebody is abandoning old people in our town they just left them which is kind of the point of this okay it was to generate a conversation about abandonment and invisibility and so this was the first time you can see that the police turned up to have a conversation but the conversations that were happening around the bed were extraordinary there were people would, would sit and up. elaine is a performer she happens to be 89 92 but she's a performer so she's skilled in helping people have that kind of conversation um, and the great story about this is that uh that that particular show which consists of people in their beds has gone through three or four versions now and it's got shinier and they've got pretty quilts and things uh, and now it started to tour and uh, where it was meant to go this year was to japan so they were going to go to japan and lie abandoned in their beds and have conversations about being made invisible so can i recommend you join an art group because you never know where it's going to take you <laughs> um but that's 
mostly I just want to end with this it's from Shakespeare give sorrow words the grief that does not speak whispers the all fraught heart and bids it break it's not nothing what we're doing is new uh, we've been doing this for a long time and we know that it works finally just because I like this people will forget what you said they forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel uh, and I think that is as good a place to any to end and invite you um i put my name in the chat box i think um over to you thoughts please what popped up as i was talking for you i see billy yeah ripon cathedral there's a there's a uh a website called I think it's called Ripple Angels or something. I looked for it while you were talking. Um, it's a really simple, beautiful thing. It's so it's made of paper and a bit of net. Yeah, whereabouts? Whereabouts is that? In, in, is it in Dublin? No, it's in the uh, UK. It's, Ripon is Yorkshire, is it not? In Yorkshire, in England, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Which means you can do it wherever you are. Yes. Uh, well, uh, about uh, about ho holding on, holding on to things. My mother is dead uh, thirty two years, and I have held on to her sheepskin coat, a dress that she loved, her pajamas, her powder her powder puff, and uh, I don't know. I refer to them at times. I, I could never get rid of them. Mm. I was talking with someone um, before Christmas, and they said uh, it was a really beautiful ten people in a conversation, and the conversation was about um, uh, uh, gratitude. Actually, was what it was about, and it became about um, keeping things and letting things go. And it started off by people talking about scars. You know, I got a cut here, and I it, this happened, and this woman said. Um, her mum had died about a year ago or a year and a bit and she died in hospital and she took her mum's slippers and she put them in the garden she put she had some steps up to her garden out the back um, and she'd put them there and they were you know fabric slippers so they were gradually falling apart in the wind and the rain and the snails and all the rest of it she said and I, I didn't quite know why I did it I didn't want them there but every day I walk past them I think about my mum and uh, and gradually they're falling apart, and that feels right. They, it's like a little memorial as they're they're rotting back into the earth, they're becoming back what they were before. She said, and and then I've realised that actually, even when they're gone, that's going to be the spot where my mum's slippers were in the garden, even when they're not there anymore. So like like Joan is saying, it's objects are powerful, no? it was absolutely lovely this is this is my mum oh Doreen was her name hi Doreen <laughs> and, and this is my mum <laughs> these are just some of her ashes in the last year when we knew that she was you know she wasn't going to be with us for much longer we made the most of it she was here with me for um the last mother's day and she grew up loving the poem, The Lake Isle of Inish Free. And even though it was out of season, I got in touch with the guy who, um, who does the, the boat tours on Loch Gill, and he took the boat out for us. And she said, I never believed I'd be here. She loved Yates. And she said, I'll sprinkle some of my ashes here. And I took her to... Um, we went to the beach at Mullock Moor and she said, oh, sprinkle me here. And I had to go. And then I, I lived in the Cayman Islands and she loved it there. And she said, oh, sprinkle me there. And I've been all around the world sprinkling, sprinkling your mother. mother's <laughs> ashes, but I kept some for myself. And I sometimes, if I'm going to special, mm. I take her with me, especially if it's with a friend that knew her and met her and loved her, which everybody did. And I just say, oh, by the way, Dor I brought Doreen with us, you know. <laughs> oh my God. I do have my dad as well. He wasn't quite the same character, 
But um, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he comes along and he's like, oh, God, have I got to go? You know, which he was like in life as well. So <laughs> thank you for that. You've just given me a way that I could approach my daughter on something because she'd love that kind of story. You know, she'd find that hilarious. And I might tell her that story that I heard today from you and maybe with that, go into the conversation a bit with her. That's it, other people's experiences. Yeah. And uh, for Joan, if you, if you particularly would like to be cremated, which is yeah. my personal choice, I think it's, you know, in the UK, most people are cremated. You know, it's, it's 8 to 20 or something, but you could, you know, you could have that conversation and, you know, explain what it means to you. But, oh, yeah, cremation all the way for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, it, the headstone uh, was the thing. You know, she said, oh, because uh, there isn't provision in Ireland uh, to put up headstones yet. They haven't really got around to cremation. I know it's very much uh, in England, yeah. but it's only now uh, with the new uh, graveyards coming on stream that the local authorities now are thinking about some kind and putting up some kind of plaques somewhere yeah but this I lived, was i lived in spain and they have that all the time yeah, yeah. Loads of places like that. so this was a huge thing uh, the headstone to be remembered with the headstone yeah. yeah yeah and you know it's it's different for everybody and it can just be a a, a certain place or as you say you know it it can be a headstone and go it go into a grave it's what gives gives people comfort because as dominic said Grief never really goes away. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's like a scar. It gradually heals a little bit and it fades. And then every now and again, you might notice it and you say, oh, gosh, you know, that mm -hmm. I remember what happened, that scar, you know, it was. And that's that's the, the grief just surfaces every now and again. Yeah. And on that, I just stuck in the chat box. Um, we Hospice Foundation launched, opened up a thing called the Bereavement Hotline, which is 1-800-80-70-77, sorry, 1-800-80-77. Um, and if you find that you want someone to talk to, they're a really good place to start. Um, and they're, they're, they're trained and experienced, they're really useful, but also you might know somebody that could really do with someone to talk to. Um, and I, I think they're a great resource to have uh, for whatever reason, might be something recent, might be something that happened a long time ago. Just um, give them a ring. That's what they're there for. Um, and I, there's all sorts of. I wouldn't think twice about ringing them. Um, but it, it is fascinating that once you, as we've seen today, once you kind of open up a space for the conversation amongst a group of people, if you can just do that first little bit, then actually people's this is part of people's lives. You know, it's a, it's a, we've all got stories. Catherine, I can see you're raising your hand. Yeah, Dominic, uh, thank you. That was a lovely talk. Like I, I nearly didn't get here, but it was a lovely talk. And I just wonder your um, slides, your, you know, that you were talking from, are they available to look yeah. back at at all? Yeah. Um, I'll have to double check that I can do that because some of them are mine and some of them are Bex's because I, borrowed from her. Yeah. No, it was a, like I'm very interested yeah. in the arts and it was a very nice um, um, demonstration of their use and the words were good, you know, right down to the quotations at the end. And a second point, um, I don't know if anybody listens to BBC Radio 3 on a Sunday at 12 o'clock. Um, there's a programme called Private Passions. And the one last Sunday, um, which I was listening to in the middle of the night, um, it's a person talking about their lives and then a piece of music. And she is a hospice doctor in the UK. Rachel Clark is her name. And um, it was a beautiful program on, you know, the meaning of hospice and what it means to be with people who are dying. Mm. It was really, really good. So I'd recommend it to anybody. And BBC Radio 3 and 4 and all the channels, they're very easy to follow and to get to listen back to on that BBC Sounds app. It, it's 
a pleasure, not like the television where we can't get BBC television. <laughs> but that's my top and safety work. Good, thank you for that. <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like like to share share their thoughts with us before we we finish up? That was really interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, and yeah. yeah, it was it was lovely, Dominic. Oh, You've uh, yeah. you, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and just to say, we recorded this, so Catherine, you'd be good. able to look back at the um, at what was done today. It would be up on our Excellent. YouTube channel. Age Action oh, okay. YouTube channel. You might have to scroll through a bit, but it'll be there. Um, okay. I have a very good friend who lives up in Donegal, and she is the sister in the hospice in Letterkenny Hospital, which is the only hospice within a hospital, I think, in Ireland. And I would say to her, oh, it must be so hard. She said, you know what? She said, there is so much joy and love and compassion and laughter she said on the wards and in the hospice she said you know it, it can be hard and it can sometimes you have a bit of a struggle and everything she said that but, but the majority of it is absolutely lovely and she loves the work that she does and she's quite like um I don't know if you know there's a a female comedian called Sarah Millican and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. very good yeah, yeah. And, and Mary <laughs> she's very like her and she tells yeah. a great story and oh she breaks all the rules for not so much during Covid but before that there was somebody mm -hmm. wanting to get married and she let them bring in pets and all sorts of things you know um, oh no I think they got married in the hospice or something they did the ceremony I don't know for the father who, who couldn't get out but um, she said it's it's very rewarding and satisfying work herself yeah so it, it is uh, you know we kind of thought when we were putting this together um, you know with our audience were we being you know is it too in your face but it, it really is something that we all need to um, face up to and, and embrace and have these conversations yeah so, the whole yeah. point of having the conversation really is so that you can get back on with the living. So, um, you know, that's it's it. like, it's, it's that whole thing about addressing the thing that's hiding under the bed. Yeah. Deal Have a look it. at it, Put sort it, it out, deal with it, and get you. back on. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. And hello to Joan Kavner, wherever you are, Joan. <laughs> Oh, Kevin, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask uh, Billy and uh, Dominic, uh, will you be having a, another talk on the actual Think Ahead form? Uh, I have got that form actually from the Act of Retirement. And uh, I, I actually uh, attended, uh, I don't know, was it a training session in, in Dublin under the hospice uh, some years ago? to be able to tell people about that uh, think ahead form. But uh, I think it's very worthwhile. Would you have a, another session on it to go through it? We absolutely will, yes. That that was what we were due to have today, but we, it, unfortunately, well, no, fortunately we couldn't because if we hadn't, we might not have got to meet Dominic and that yeah, was yeah. A, real, <laughs> a real blessing for us. So, yeah. uh, you know, thinking about the way they're meant to. <laughs> And we will definitely have Bex on and we'll be arranging that and we'll be sending out the, the link for that because we, we know how important that is. I have one myself, yeah. And I, I went into the hospice, um, the uh, um, IHF, <laughs> and I picked up, I think I went and got 50 of them. And <laughs> for a, a group. Is that, had somebody is that, the, is that this it. one here? Yeah, that, exactly. That that's here, it, yeah. 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 And... I thought I was going to, I got them and I was distributing them out. I think they're, once you buy a certain amount, they're a euro or they're two euros, you know, and, or you can download it um, from the. I website. got mine from the um, Citizens Advice Centre. They just hand me a copy. That's it. They're, you can get them from different places. And um, mine were gone so quickly. They, you know, mm. they didn't last at all. The group that um, I got them for took them and then people at work so it is really and it, it's also something it's a framework um yeah. 
And, you know, it can help you have those conversations, even if you were to say, oh, can you help me fill this out, you know? Yeah, excellent. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> Play dumb. <laughs> I do it very well. <laughs> Get in there sideways, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, listen, everybody seems to seems to have enjoyed that. And I'd just like to thank, thank Dominic once again for stepping in and giving us a wonderful um a wonderful morning so thanks very uh, much it's been a pleasure and Teresa Duffy I see your question I will get someone to answer that for you properly and I'll send it back to Annette oh that's it I see that Teresa let me just make yeah. a note yep um but thanks very much it's been lovely spending an hour in your company and uh that's what a lovely way to spend it on Wednesday morning yes. thank you very much okay well we'll let you know All the best. thank you bye-bye Next, bye -bye. next week next week is is coming up to valentine's day so oh. what's love got to do with it and um we've got father simon um he's going to be talking to us about the um the relics that we have here in dublin and how st valentine is tied in um with um the church or the white friar um, oh okay interesting so, yeah. Hope you can join us then. Listen, bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks yeah. so much. bye, darling. Thank and you. Thank you bye. as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye right. now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. And bye-bye from Doreen. <laughs>